So what I want to touch on today is the fact that many times as Christians we're tired. Many times as Christians we, we don't feel all there. Can I get an amen on that or am I the only one? It happens. We're tired. We're discouraged. You ever waited for a promise and don't, don't understand why it has to take so long to get that promise? You know, so many of us as Christians, we, we live this farce life where we want to appear to have it all together, but we don't. And the points I want to cover is, could our feelings be coming in between God and us? You see, feelings are the best thing and the worst thing that humans have. Feelings could drive you to do better, or feelings could drive you to do worse. And ultimately, I want to talk about how do we keep up our pace. So let's talk about John chapter 20. Open up with me if you can. John chapter 20, verse 1 through 4. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw the stone already removed from the groove across the entrance of the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, John, whom Jesus loved, esteemed, and said to him, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple left, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and arrived at the tomb first. I want to stop there, and I want us to understand what's happening here. So, who was in the tomb? Jesus, very good. So this is the day after, this is days after the crucifixion. Amen? So listen to what verse 1 says again. It says, now on the first day of the week. So the first day of the week is what day? Very good. Sunday. It's not Monday. Excellent. Um, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. It says, while it was still dark. So we have to understand. We, I, I, I really, I've been trying to read the Bible different. You know, because there's so many keys to the Bible that are written that we don't read. Does that make sense? You know, we kind of skip over them. So we, we miss things like the fact that Mary Magdalene was there early, which means she probably couldn't sleep. I'm going to go as far as saying that Mary Magdalene was probably dealing with some aggressive anxiety, maybe even depression, maybe sorrow, because she just lost Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, I think sometimes we read this book like it's a story, and we don't realize sometimes the in-depth emotions and feelings and just stuff that's going on in here, you know? And, and maybe that's why we can't relate our lives to the people that are in this book that much. Maybe there's that disconnect. Maybe, maybe that's why we, we can't really read the Bible and understand how great it was to see miracles like the blind man seeing or, or the, deaf man speak, uh, the deaf man hearing or the mute speaking. You know, maybe because we haven't been there, we can't really embrace it. And maybe that's why we don't believe for bigger things because maybe, and I say maybe, Maybe a lot of times we allocate the victories that we have in our life, the testimonies that are built up in our life, to ourselves. Maybe we think, maybe, we think that, hey, I did it because I got a good job. I got this. I did that. And, and even though we say all the glory to God, maybe our words aren't always fully understandable or fully full of truth. Does that make sense? So, so here we go, and it says that Mary Magdalene, while it was still dark... She saw the stone already removed from the groove across the entrance of the tomb. Now, if you understand the, what's happening here, that she realized that the stone was put there by various men when the whole situation went down and, and he was put in the tomb. It took many men to put that there. And, and if you understand the Bible and you understand that Sunday is the first day of the week, you also understand that Saturday is the day of Sabbath, which means that ain't nobody... Going to that tomb on Saturday. Ain't nobody moving that rock on Saturday. So you see how in debt this is getting now? Now paint the picture. So somebody moved that rock on a day where no one else could work. But isn't it awesome that we have a God that has no days off? Isn't it awesome that even if it's late in the night or early in the morning, our God is really willing and able to listen and respond. 
Isn't it awesome that our God is not structured by what we say service times are, but He will appear, He will manifest, He will direct, He will change, He will alter your life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it awesome to know that truly, like the, the song says, no matter how high we go, or how low we go, or how wide we go, He's there. I mean, the Bible goes as far as saying that if you're in hell, He's there with you. I know, we just not. But no, you got to understand, even when you and I are in hell, in hell, and what I mean by in hell, because it's not like we're going down to hell and we see this red being with horns and a tail and a big pitchfork. No, no, no. The hell that the Bible is talking about is a hell that's internal to us, is the state of depression and anger and hurt and resentment that we all have in our life. So he's saying even when you're in your most depressive state, even when you're in your worst feeling state, even when everybody turns their back on you, even when you're there, he's there with you. I mean, we sang a song just now where he talks about going up the mountain. And, 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 you know, I'll be honest with you, when I first read the scriptures and I first got to that story of the 99 sheep and the one, I said, God, you don't make sense. How and why would you leave 99 for one? How? I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, you got to cut your losses at a point. He doesn't cut his losses. He says, I have invested so much love into those 99 that those 99 will stay right where I left them because they understand my love. Those 99 will not move. And those 99, instead of just being there and wondering, why did my pastor leave? Those 99 are actually interceding for that one. So those 99 are saying, right now is not my time to be filled. Right now is my time to pray for my brother or my sister to be filled. It took years for me to understand that. A lot of stuff in this book doesn't make sense to me. I can lie to you and tell you I've read the Bible and everything is holy. Hallelujah. There's some stuff that I read and I'm like, God, why would you let Hosea go through this? Why would you let this man go through this? Why would you let this woman go through this? Why, why, you know, why did Ruth do what she did? You know, sometimes I scratch my head, but I read it over and over. And I've been reading it like I'm reading this one verse. I mean, we're still on the first verse. Because there's no rush. People are like, oh, but pastor, you're on the same thing. Amen, receive every week. That's the whole point. Sometimes I wish we don't put anything up on the screen and don't even give titles to preachings so people just think it's an ongoing thing. Because sometimes we get so stuck on structure that we want God to manifest and to do the way we say, God, today is Sunday. Today you have to bless me. He doesn't have to do anything. Wake up Saturday night and say, God, today is Saturday. Thank you for already blessing me. Thank you for doing what you do. I mean, do you realize that you're only here and I'm only here because his mercy was new this morning with us. And he said, I'm going to keep that heart ticking. I'm going to keep that blood flowing. I'm going to keep that muscle moving. I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you knowledge. I'm going to give you, I mean, you know, we take for granted the fact that we got here. There's so many people that can't get in a car. There's so many people that can't leave their house. There's so many people that don't, don't remember who God is. People who are affected by things like Alzheimer's and dementia, bipolar disorder, suicidal thoughts and, and depression and all these things. And we're here, we're like, oh, my life is so bad. No, their lives are bad. You're blessed. You are highly favored from the God of all gods, the one that said, let there be and there was. You are a king's kid. You are valuable. You are awesome. You were, you were formed after his own image and likeness. He detailed every single aspect of you, every single point of your life. He made it happen for a reason the way it has. But Lord, I want this so bad. And you will get it when it's the right time. God is not going to say, I'm going to give you this job. I'm going to give you this kid. I'm going to give you this marriage until he knows you're darn ready for it. Because if you're not, then what good is it? Sometimes we fight for things that we're just not ready for. Amen? So the groove, the, the tomb is open. So she ran. I mean, she saw that, and it says, the Bible says, she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, John, whom Jesus loved, esteemed. Now, the Bible, in the Amplified Version, says it's John. 
Many historians believe it's John, but nowhere is it confirmed that John is that disciple that's the beloved. And I make that clear because just because an amplified version of a scripture or a, a Bible dictionary says something does not mean it's gospel. Now, I say that so that we don't walk around saying, well, you know who wrote the book of Hebrews, right? Who wrote it? No, it says that it's Luke. You see what I'm saying? So you get different things and you, you scratch your head and you're like, well, who was this and who was that? You know what I mean? But the bottom line is that it doesn't matter. If you read the Bible and you put it in action, it doesn't matter if it was Frodo from The Hobbit. It doesn't matter. This is life. That's all that matters. We can't get stuck on, well, I wonder if it was John. Or I wonder if it was Simon. Or I wonder. It doesn't matter who it was. It's you. You're the beloved disciple of Jesus. It continues saying, the one that Jesus loved and esteemed, and said to them, this is Mary talking to him, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple left. There wasn't much talk after that, right? And they were going to the tomb, and this is the key, and it says, and the two were running together. I mean, think about it. You just lost your most your best friend. And these two men, they heard this. Now, I, you know, sometimes I scratch my head because I'm like, if you really loved them, why weren't you there where Mary was? What was going on in, in Simon Peter's life and the esteemed disciple? Why, why did she show up? You know, this is where I, I, I get caught up on so many churches and so many doctrines where they say that women can't do this and women can't do that and women can't be pastors and women can't preach. Shut up. Honestly, I mean, there's women in Scripture that I'm sure if I give you, I'll give you a perfect example, Phoebus. It was a woman in the Bible, study it when you can, and see how impacting her actions were in Scripture. And as a woman, I encourage you to read the Bible and find, the, the, I mean, a Ruth, you know, a, a Naomi, these women that, I mean, Deborah, these women that were, were, were change makers, earth shakers. So here is this woman, a perfect example, Mary Magdalene, who decided, I'm going to go outside of the normal times. A Hannah, who the Bible says she was prized with being able to have the ability to give birth. Why? Because she wasn't waiting for church to open up to go and then do the Christian thing. She was in front of the synagogue crying, so much so that the pastor was like, this girl's nuts, she must be drunk. Who comes to church when it's not church time? Hannah did. What did she get? The petition of a heart. It continues saying, So Peter and the other disciple left and they were going to the tomb and the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. And this is the key here. He outran them. In other words, they were running together, but Peter got slow. I mean, but, but it really relates to me when it says that because I say, you know, the other disciple really loved and esteemed Jesus. And when you really, really love someone and you really, really care about someone, man, if someone says, hey, they're there or hey, they were there and they're not there, you jet. It's like when you lose a child or, or, or your kid gets lost and all of a sudden, I mean, I remember a story of a grandmother that one time her, 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 grand her grandchild was impaled underneath a car and an old lady, I believe she was 83 years old, went and picked up the back of a car so that the child can get out. You know, that adrenaline that rushes in you. But that adrenaline is related completely to your heart. See, your pump starts moving, your heart starts pumping faster. When you really love, when you really care, even if you're in a moment of sobbing, which they were, because hello, they were still mourning. They just probably passed that whole Sabbath crying and talking to each other and wondering why Jesus died. Because even though he died, we will see in later passage how they didn't understand what Jesus said while he was alive, that he had to die. I mean, we know that the Bible says that many of his own disciples rebuked Jesus when Jesus said he had to die. He goes, no, the Lord rebuke you. No, the Lord rebuke you. I'm on a mission. It doesn't matter what you say. I came for this purpose. Man, who is God talking to besides me today? It says, so Peter and the other disciple left, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and arrived at the tomb first. Now, this is where it gets really interesting in verse 5. It says, stooping down and looking in, 
he saw the linen wrappings, wrapping neatly lying there, but he did not go in. So, understand, two guys run. I got to believe Mary was probably running, but in this point it's showcased on them too. These two guys ran. The one guy got there first. Now his adrenaline is pumping, but he gets to the outer court and he stops. Now relate that to back in the days of the tabernacle, how there were certain levels of the tabernacle that you went in. And depending on your relationship with God, you either made it or you got struck. You know, history tells us that priests in those days would tie history, not the Bible. History tells us that they would tie something to their ankle with a bell on it. And if the bell stopped ringing, the people would start pulling it out. Because that means they're dead. Because the glory of God, the Shekinah, the power of God was so, so awesome that sin could not be in the presence of God. That's crazy stuff, right? So, so the beloved disciple ran. He busted his butt. He got there first, but he did not go past that door. He just looked. And, and, and this talks so much to so many of us, because a lot of times in our emotion, in our Christian emotion, we get so riled up, the adrenaline starts kicking, you know, we, we feel that brush of God. You ever felt that brush of God, that, that I don't know what, you know, like they say in French, je ne sais pas, that, that something that just, that touches you and you're like on fire and it's I love God and this and that and you want to give triple tides and you want to do this and you want to do that and you get to the door and then you're like, wait a second. I don't know if I'm ready to go in there. The adrenaline halted. The horses stopped. Something stopped you. All of a sudden, you had to stop because you said, I can see him, but I don't know if I want to touch him. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm ready to change because you got to understand, the life of that disciple would have changed in the moment he passed through that door. And many of us do exactly that. Many of us, we come in on a Sunday morning, and I use Sunday as an example. We come in on a Sunday morning, and we're right at the door, and we stop. I don't know if I want to go in there. I don't know if I want to let them in. I'm just afraid what's going to happen if I go there. And that's why the Christian church is where it's at today. That's why so many leaders are committing suicide. So many pastors are committing suicide. So many people are denouncing Christ because they've gotten to the point where they're at the door, they look in, they see the glory of God, but they're like, I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. What are people going to think? What is, what is all my, my proselytes going to think of me? What are all my followers going to think of me? What if I do change? What if I come out of the closet? What if I, I what, if, what if, what if, what if, what if? I'm afraid. What will they say? Who cares? Christianity is not but about what people will say or what people will think. It's not about that. These men, these, these women that were followers of Christ, they never cared about what people were going to think after they said, I do to Christ. They didn't care. I mean, they had their moments of failure. Come on, we all do. You know, the, the three times the rooster crowed. We know that story. They fail, and that's just so that we understand. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have problems. We're going to fall every so often. But you know what? They sold out. They said, you know what, Christ, if you go there, I'm there. I'm leaving mother. I'm leaving father. I'm leaving everything. I'm leaving my business. I mean, Peter was a fisherman. He left his boat. He left his nets. He left everything that was of value to follow Christ. I mean, can you imagine if God came down right now and said, Liz, I need you to leave hope. You'd be like, but, but God, how am I going to pay the bills? And then as the young ruler, he looks at you and he goes, just follow me. Follow me and I'll take care of it. It's hard to say, okay, Lord, I'll do it. That's the truth. I could say, oh, no, we can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens us. Hallelujah. And then you wake up. And then you look around. And your bank account is empty. And you're saying, Yo, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? I'm getting old. I mean, I was listening to a preaching this morning about Abraham and Sarah. I mean, can you imagine God comes down and says, you're going to have a child, and you're like, all right, I'm 20 years old, I'm going to have a child. You know, you think automatically, this is going to be easy. All I got to do is... Dum, dum. But now you became 30, and the doom doom becomes... Dum, 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 dum. And now you turn 40, and it's more like... Tum, tum, tum. But now you hit 50. Now it's blue pill tomb. 
but now you pass 60 and 70 and 80 and 90. <laughs> At that point, you're like, no, thank you. But God made a promise. And, and we know that Isaac, the, the name Isaac means laughter. And we know that, that, that Sarah laughed at the promise that was made to Abraham, because it was made to Abraham first, she laughed at it. Because she said, <laughs> I got nothing going on. And sometimes, as Christians, that's where we need to be. We need to get to that point where we realize, it's not about me. It's not about what I can do. It's not that God wants you to suffer. It's not that God wants you to get it to ground zero. It's just that sometimes God realizes the level of pride that's in us and he's got to allow that pride to go out like a hot balloon. He's got to... Because if there's a little... Then sometimes we say, it was me. A lot of our dreams, a lot of the promises he gives to us, we can all sit here and make lists. Well, God said I was going to do this and God said I was going to do that. I mean, I have one of the major promises that God made to my life was that I was going to touch the, the continent of Australia. And part of me says, I don't want to. It's 24 hours in a plane. I mean, I could, I could lie to you, but that's the truth. Another part of me says, but God, you're delaying. And I can hear God from heaven saying, brother, you don't want to get on a plane for 24 hours. What do you care about the promise? Right? Lord, I want a child. Oh, I ain't cleaning up this caca from my dog. No. Good luck. Put things into perspective for a second. Lord, I want a big house. Well, you're going to have big bills. Bigger. And a lot of us take for granted where we're at in life, and we blame God. God, you promised. Yes, he promised. But you're not ready. That's not a bad thing. Because guess what? While we're breathing, we still have the capability to achieve it. So what do we do? Watch this. The two were running together, but one of, the, one, one of the, the disciple outran Peter and arrived at the tomb first. Stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings neatly lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came up following him, and he went into the tomb and saw the linen wrappings neatly lying there. And the burial face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the other linen wrappings. Now, historians... Because there's, there's some research you got to do. You can't just jump over. There's a reason the Bible says everything, right? So historians say that Jesus in this moment, and I say historians, scientists, whatever you want to call it, it was odd to see that the headpiece was separate from the body piece. Because if he would have been brought up like a ghost or like a spirit, then it would have all fell exactly where it was. So the belief is, the, the, the doctrinal belief is that Jesus actually stood up as a man, not as a ghost, not as a spirit, removed his headpiece, put it to the side, and then took off the rest of it. Now that's much more deeper than it being a ghost, because, you know, if it's a ghost, it's done. Everything lies right there. No, no, no. There's detail in Scripture. It just shows you that even after all those days, of being dead, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. In his human form, he was still able, he was still able to get up. Even after the days that we've gone through in our life, the trials, the tribulations, the waiting, even after that, you are still able to get up. I am still able to get up. No matter what we're confronting, no matter what we're dealing with, no matter how big the Goliath, we are still able to get up. No matter how many holes we have in our hands, in our heart, in our feet, no matter how many piercings we have on our side, we are still able to get up. Amen. When I read this, I say, whoa, God, the detail that's in here, and I'm sorry, maybe I'm reading it too slow for you. I'm a little slow, but I get really excited when I find things in something that I've looked at for so long. It's like when you find money inside a, 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 a drawer that you had clothes in, and you've gone in that drawer a million times, but you didn't find the money. And then you start saying, Lord, it's a miracle. No, you didn't look good enough. It's always been there. 
God does not come down from heaven and send his guardian angel with a 50 spot. Move your clothes and put it right there. I'm sorry. I love those stories. They're so awesome. But come on, they're stories. It was always there. We got to be human before we're spirits. Amen? It's in there. It's like prego. Everything is in here. This is not new revelation. It's just called read and study. Educate yourself. The same way we read books on self-betterment. The same way we watch videos on self-motivation and we got Tony Robbins on our favorite queue. That same way we got to do with this. And I'm not throwing in directs to anyone. Please don't take it that way. I'm talking to myself. I'm, I am. I'm, I'm genuinely talking to myself because there's moments where I get up and I say, oh, I got to listen to so-and-so. And I'm like, no, I got to listen to Jesus. Amen. This is what it continues saying. And the burial face cloth, I'm in verse 7, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the other linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, the beloved, right? It says, who had reached the tomb first, went in two. He went in two. In other words, he went in after. There was something about Peter that didn't stop him at the doorway. The beloved disciple, the one that loved Jesus, the one that went to church every week, the one that lied on Jesus' chest, the one that, that was at the Last Supper, I'm sure, cleaning and doing and working and serving, that beloved disciple was afraid to go past the threshold. But Peter, Peter, the one that denied him, come on, he had denied him for a couple of days back. He had denied him. I mean, he had denied him. He had denied the Messiah. He knew the truth. He looked at him. He said, I don't know him. The Bible says that at one point he even started cursing. And, and I, I share this with you because sometimes we will curse. And sometimes we will deny him. And sometimes because of our environment, we will say, I don't know who he is. I'm not Christian. Or maybe our actions will say it. But that should not stop you from going past the threshold into the Holy of Holies. Because if you understand the blood of the Lamb and what He gave up for you, nothing, nothing, tell the person next to you, nothing should stop you from going in. Nothing. So you went out clubbing last night. So what? I'm not saying it's right, but Jesus Christ, Lord Almighty, come to church, bust through that door. Understand that His love, His mercy, it's ongoing. It's forever and ever and ever. And I'm not saying, well, Lord, it's Saturday night and I'm getting ready to go and there's something touching my heart and it's not heartburn, it's conviction. And you know you shouldn't be going out with that guy because you know you're married and then all of a sudden you're like, Lord, Lord, I'm just going to go to evangelize. No, you're not. Come on. I just need to share with someone. Share with your spouse. Come on. But even when you do that, even when you do that, even when you fall, even when you're caught in adultery, even when you're caught in fornication, even when you're drunk as a skunk, even as you're whatever it is, come through that threshold. Come through that threshold. Push through that door. Push aside. And if somebody's in your way, get them out of your way. Tell them, no, no, no. I got a meeting. Oh, you're a hypocrite. How can you go to church? Easy. I get in my car. I turn it on drive and I go. And when I get into church, I open up my heart. Oh, but you're a hypocrite. What are people going to think? It doesn't matter because guess what? No one can save you. I go as far as saying it doesn't matter what I think of you. Because your relationship with God is independent of me. Yeah. Trust me, I got enough problems on my own. You have every single right to be in this place. Every single right to go through that door. Every single right to go into the Holy of Holies. You are worthy. You have been sanctified, consecrated, set apart, called for a reason, anointed since before the womb of your mother. Amen. He knew you. I know it sounds crazy when we talk about before the womb of our mother. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, you're crazy. But it's not. And you don't know how much God had to do to get you to here. You know, when I think of stories, and I'm sorry if I bore you guys with my own personal stories, but to me it's majestic, I like to call it. It's majestic to think that God had such a purpose for me that my mother, in, in, her, in her state of, of just trying to be the best person she can be prior to me and after me, she had eliminated her two children. But I was stuck in the middle because God had a purpose for me. He had a plan for me. So even if my mother had made maybe a wrong decision, that didn't stop God from doing what he had to do. I was designated for greatness from before the womb of my mother. 
2,000 plus years ago. He knew who my mother was. He knew what she was going to do. He knew where she was going to be. He knew who she was going to have. He knew it. It wasn't a coincidence. Your life is not a coincidence. Your call is not a coincidence. The fact that you're here today is not a coincidence. God has everything planned out strategically. The fact that you have the voice you have is not a coincidence. Every gift that you have, every call over your life is not a coincidence. Guess what? You didn't do it. Oh, but you play that guitar so good, Brother William. It wasn't Brother William's learning. It was God's inspiration in him. Oh, but pastor, you preach. It's not preaching. It's just talking about all the junk that I've been through. All the junk in my trunk going through it on a Saturday night basis saying, Oh, I remember this. I'm sorry if my junk smells so much. I'm sorry if it's bad. I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing about it. But it's what I live off of. It's my lions and it's my bears. It's what helps me to get up in front of this Goliath today and say, Joel, you're dealing with this, you're dealing with that. But greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ Jesus. I can love the unlovable. I can't push past my emotions. I can't push past my feelings. I can do it in Him. Because guess what? We all have hard moments. So the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in too. He needed some motivation. He saw somebody do it. Somebody testified. You see, the testimony from Peter wasn't a verbal one. It was an actual physical action that he took. Sometimes we need to, somebody, to see somebody do something, right? He says he, reached, he went into and he saw the wrappings and the face cloth and believed. And I love the Amplified Version because it says, without any doubt that Jesus had written from the dead, risen from the dead. So now he believed. But Jesus said he was going to do it. Do you understand where I'm coming from? This is the beloved disciple. Man, this is the guy that had it all right. Now he believes because he's able to see. But what does the Bible say? It says, blessed, bienaventurados, the ones who have not seen yet believe. Anyone can see and believe. Any one of us. If we got money in the bank, oh, we're believers. Hallelujah. God of prosperity. Anyone can believe if they've been healed. If the doctor says, take this medicine and you're going to be okay. Okay, I believe, Lord. But what about those moments when the doctor says, you're dying? You got a tumor the size of a football. You're going. What about those moments? I want to talk to someone that's dealing with an impossibility today and I'm finishing with this. Because I believe that God wants to do something impossible in our lives. Impossible. I'm not talking about God. I need to know the direction for where I'm going to do this and what I'm going to do tomorrow. No, no, no. I'm talking about impossible. You know the stuff that we ignore? I know I'm the only one. The stuff that we push so far deep inside. That we make believe it doesn't exist. Because we don't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody. We're supposed to be Christians. You know those, those, those situations in our life that we don't expose to anyone because God forbid if they find out, I'm supposed to be a believer. How do you think your testimony will be established if it's your secret? How? What if God forbid you had AIDS and you never told anyone and you were healed? Congratulations. It's a secret testimony. What if everybody thinks your marriage is a okay and your marriage is a hot mess, but you don't tell anybody, and then all of a sudden it gets restored, and then you say, oh, my marriage is great. Everybody's going to be like, yeah, we all knew your marriage was great. You don't know what happens. You don't know where I was, but it's your secret testimony. God wants us to dig deeper, and I'm sorry. And I keep apologizing today. Because you see, I realize one thing. My, my relationship with God it doesn't have to be like your relationship and vice versa. We're all different. And I'm a little bit radical when it comes to things in my life. Because I'll be honest with you, I'm tired of wasting time. I'm tired of it. You know, I've realized that every time I push the limit, God blesses me. Not one-fold, but a hundred-fold. I'm tired of being a one-fold Christian. 
I'm tired of getting one full blessings. The one full blessings I do myself. Come on. I want a hundred full blessings. I want the blessings that I could never do on my own. Ever. You know, I, I, I sit sometimes in the business world and I listen to people that are seeking for answers to do things that I'm already doing. But when you share those answers with them, they say, oh, no, no. It can't be done. I'm doing it. No, 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 no. We got to do it this way. I already have a way. No, no, no. We got to spend X amount of thousand dollars. Can I show you what I'm doing? No, 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 no. I got to do it my way. No, no, no. We need it to work into our program. Okay. Dude, do whatever you want to do. But I'm telling you, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is right here. This is what it's all about. Tired? Yeah. Sometimes I am. Sometimes I'm sure you are. But God brought us here today to tell us that even though we got outrun, it may be somebody got there before us. Maybe you look around and you say, man, you know what? They got it all put together. Maybe they did. Maybe they do. But you're here right now. Just pass through that threshold, please. He's saying, man, I'm climbing up mountains for you. I am breaking walls down. He has broken a wall in your life today. He, I mean, I visualize God with a pair of Timberlands and just slamming the walls of disbelief in our life. I, I visualize him running up a mountain like I, I don't even know who and just running at all costs like the prodigal, fa- the, the prodigal son's father. I visualize him running to me when I'm stuck in the mud and I'm like, Lord, that's it, that last breath. And you're like, oh, I'm dying. And then all of a sudden that hand comes down and it pulls you out. That's how I visualize him. He's my superhero. He's my superman, except he's God. He's it, man. He's the answer. I know it's easier said than done. I know it's easier to hear it and feel that I don't know what inside, but another thing is actually relating to it. I know, I know, I know, but let me tell you, man, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. He doesn't love me more than he loves you. He loves you. Is my life extra, incredibly great? No, man. I wake up some days and I want to give everybody the finger. I do. But then I remember that he didn't give me the finger. In fact, he gives me the arms. He embraces me and he loves me and he lifts me and he blesses me. And there's days where I'm good and there's days where I'm bad but I'm not going to stop going through that threshold. I'm not going to stop pushing through. So I encourage you today. Feel encouraged that you can get through that threshold, that you are worthy, that you do deserve it, that you do deserve to smile, that you do deserve to be happy, that you do deserve to be a king's kid. You deserve it. Not because of anything you did or anything I did, but because of what he's done for us. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. Like, comment, and subscribe at www.facebook.com front slash NBMINY or our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com front slash NBMICHURCH. Also check out our new and improved website at www.newbeginningschurches.com And finally, check out our new awesome church app, available on both Android and Apple platforms. Search your app store for NBMICHURCH and be blessed.